Hello everyone, you're watching David the Real Medvite and thank you for tuning in. This is, we're back to regularly scheduled programming, videos like this. Expect more, um, especially since Lent is approaching and um, I think this is just a good time to kind of slow the pace down a little bit, you know, cease from uh, polemics like we usually do and just get back to like regular videos and I think this is one of those regular videos that I'm going to get into and uh, I'm pretty sure most of my viewers have heard about Toll Houses and there's a lot of people that have a lot to say about Toll Houses but one thing I've noticed about this debate is that a lot of people who want to talk about this don't really understand what's going on some of the people just genuinely don't know and some of the other people uh they know a bit too much and they go too much into detail when they don't keep things basic, basic, which is exactly why I'm here. This video is going to be basic surface level. It's not going to be too basic surface level, but it is going to be mostly basic. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe the kind of arguments against the doctrine of the toll houses, then explain what it even is, arguments for it. And I want to conclude this video with what I think about the whole topic. And I want to keep this short and sweet. So let's just begin with this video. Um, well, the most popular arguments against toll houses you will see is that a lot of people have concerns that toll houses, it seems to explicitly teach that demons dictate whether we are saved or not. And for a lot of people, this is incredibly concerning because this will, this will mean that demons are ultimately judging us. And we're being judged by demons. And that seems like a very counterintuitive statement. Well, now, wouldn't it? Another argument is that people kind of assume that um, that one of the claims is that, oh, do you really believe there are literal toll boots up in the air where demons sit and they're going to judge you for the sins you've done? The only one who can judge your sins is God. Only God can judge your sins. Demons cannot do anything about it. These are like the most common arguments you will hear against the toll houses. Now, I want to st kind of start by saying just my own short commentary. Yes, demons do not dictate. Uh, they cannot judge whether we are saved or not. I definitely agree. I will even go as far as to say this idea of toll boots up in the air where the demons sit. and That's completely ludicrous. That is not true. However, what's really good is that no one who's pro toll house actually believes that. They don't believe in these kinds of arguments, right? And the biggest misunderstanding about toll houses is that people assume that it's, these are like literalistic, literal toll booths up in the air that we are being judged by or whatever. Um, or that demons will dictate whether we are saying they're, they're or judges. No one who's for toll houses actually really believes that. And even if they believe that, most of the pro toll house people will say, this guy's heretical. That's not what we are saying. Now, do mind what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that the, that the doctrine of toll houses is merely figurative. I'm not saying that either. I'm not trying to make that kind of an argument. The argument I'm making is the toll house, there's, there's a toll house imagery that is definitely figurative and analogical, but it describes something real. And that reality, simply stated, is that the soul is going to be battling against the aerial powers, against the demons, after we die. That is literally what the Toll House Doctrine is. It's as simple as that. That's what, that's what it is. I mean, I could just cut the video here and say, thank you for watching and goodbye. It's really comically as basic as that. Um, so a lot of people get into the kind of debate and the figurative language. As we're going to be seeing in this uh, patristic quotations, most of the saints don't use toll house imagery. There's a few of them that use toll house imagery, but the toll house proponents seem to still use those quotations. I wonder why. It is because what they're really trying to say is, we believe in the doctrine that after death, man's soul is going to try to go to heaven, try to go to God. And during that, you can say journey, it is going to be attacked by demons who is going to be between earth and the heavens, right? When someone is saying, I defend the toll houses, 99% of the time, that's what they're saying. So I think this is a very big misconception that we kind of have to delete from our minds. I've genuinely never seen a toll house defender, like, take the Gnostic interpretation. And ironically, 
The person who makes the argument that Toll House is Gnostic is Lazar Pohalo, who's a complete freak and who no one should listen to. So you might say, oh, he's a bishop. I don't care. He told a recovering uh, transgender person to kill themselves because they tried to recover and become straight. And he's pushing homosexuality, all of that kind of stuff in the church. I don't care what he has to say. Someone like that, if an argument comes from a person like that, you can probably just say, yeah, I'm not going to listen to anything you say. But let's move further on and uh, see, what, the, what do the Toll Houses describe? Well, the Toll Houses, the doctrine, describes the struggle the soul goes through after its death. The demons battle against our soul. And they'll try to drag us down to hell in various different ways, right? Some of them might be true deception. Some of them might be true uh, scare tactics in multitude of ways. And we will be defended by uh, the prayers of the saints, by the angels, by a guardian angel uh, that are going to try to help us persevere through our journey. Our past sins will be brought up against us to dissuade us from desiring salvation from God and to demoralize us. Uh, this is kind of what the imagery of the toll house, the, the boots of the toll house boots of sin, right? The the booth of gluttony, for example, the booth of lust. This is kind of what they're describing: is that your past sins in in those categories are going to be used against you by the demons. And as Ephesians two two says, Saint Paul says this: the demons inhabit the aerial realm. And this aerial realm is between heaven and earth, as St. Jerome says, and many other church fathers say. And our soul passes through the aerial realm after death to reach God. Ecclesiastes 12.7 says, describes where the soul is headed after death. Now, of course, some people might wonder and ask a question like, so are you saying that the, that the soul kind of just goes from one place or another? I thought the soul was incorporeal and immaterial. Well, St. John Damascus says, yes, the soul is incorporeal, it's immaterial, but compared to God, it isn't. And what he's kind of just saying there is that God is omnipresent, but our soul is not omnipresent, right? So our soul still, even after death, has to go from one place to another. So that's kind of like what he's getting at is that it's not absolutely incorporeal in the sense that it's omnipresent, where it can fill all things, like God can, right? But our soul is still nevertheless something immaterial. Like, you know, this is why you have, there's some silly researches people do. It's like, oh, I'm going to vase someone before they die and I'm going to vase them after their death and... I'm going to calculate um, how much their soul weighs, right? That, <laughs> no, the soul is immaterial. You can't weigh it with kilograms, okay? So we're not like Philoxenus of Mabok who, who are, who are we're not materialists, right? But um, again, the soul is going to be journeying from the body after death to the kingdom of heaven, to God. So in short, the toll houses, the doctrine describes this kind of a gigantic psyop campaign from the demons against our soul after death that is going to be continuing. And so I want to kind of reverse this Gnostic argument and ask this question or make this argument. If, the to if this is false, right? You just listen to me what I had to say. If the idea that our soul has to combat and is attacked by demons, if that idea is false and is somehow Gnostic, one has to wonder... Why cannot the demons attack our soul? If they cannot attack our soul after death, then that seems to imply that the soul is somehow immune from temptations against, from the demons. But wouldn't this imply that the body somehow is the cause of these temptations, is the reason why the soul can be attacked? Well, that seems to be the case. Wouldn't that make the body evil, this kind of vessel that harbors and attracts attacks against the soul? Well, that's pretty much what the implication will be, which the implication is that the body will then be evil. So I think denying this doctrine actually, in essence, is Gnostic. Um, the soul can totally be attacked uh, by demons, even after it's separated from the body. So we have to kind of keep that in mind. Now, of course, the explanations that I gave might be insufficient which is why I will be giving scriptural arguments, liturgical arguments, and patristic arguments. And we're going to go through what the fathers say, what the scripture says. And so you can get the picture from them as well. And you're going to notice that most of the people who use these quotes, you're going to notice some of the arguments, some of the nuances here. So 
scriptural arguments, let's take a look here. Eph Eph Ephesians 6, 12, St. Paul says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. High places. Ephesians 2, 2, he says, that, you know, who are in those high places? Demons are. So we are wrestling against demons, not only in our life, but also after our death. And so some Protestants look at this and say, this is a complete stupid reading. And you ask them, okay, what is the reading based on then? It is, a, it is about world governments. What? <laughs> St. Paul is not talking against world governments here. In, in Ephesians 6, he then uses the armor of God analogy, which, by the way, he gets it from a, suppo a quote, apocryphal book, Wisdom of Solomon. I'm not joking. He gets it from Wisdom of Solomon. So that, that's another question to Protestants. Why is St. Paul explicitly quoting from an apocryphal book on making a very important analogy? No, he's talking about that we should armor ourselves um, when we are fighting against demons. Luke 12, 20, and this is from the literal translation. And God said to him, Unthinking one, this night thy soul they shall require from thee, and what things thou didst prepare, to whom shall they be? And St. Theophylact's commentary is very illuminating on what this means. St. Theophylact emphasized on the verse, they will require, and essentially is talking about angels here. The fearsome angels will ask for your souls, and you will not want to give to it, uh, give it because you love this life and claim the things of this life as your own, but they do not demand the soul of a righteous man because he himself commits his soul into the hands of God and Father of Spirits. And he does so with joy and gladness, not in the least bit greed that he's handing over his soul to God. For him, the body is only a light burden, easily shed. But the sinner has made his soul fleshy, something difficult to separate from the body. This is why the soul must be demanded of him, the same way that, that harsh tax collectors treat debtors who refuse to pay what is due. So there is this kind of analogy, right? They, the demons are kind of these tax collectors who are collecting uh, taxes and debts from our soul or from our bodies. Now let's look at the patristic arguments for, for toll houses. This is from St. Basil Great on the counter of Psalm 7. I'm not going to read everything, but but look at what St. Basil says, right? He, he says that, uh, that the noble athletes of God who have wrestled considerably with the invisible enemies during the whole of their lives, after they have escaped all their persecution and reached the end of life, are examined by the prince of the world. Who is the prince of the world? Who is this title given to? To Satan, to the demons, right? So even after death, their souls are going to be, in a way, examined by demons. Now, this examination is not where the de where Satan is going to look at your soul and he's going to say, okay, you can pass, sir, right? That is not the analogy. But they're going to examine you and they're going to attack you and they're going to use every kinds of tricks against you to drag your soul to hell. That is what is going to happen. So that's what St. Basil says, right? St. Basil the Great, very important saint, explicitly teaches this doctrine. This is from the book On the Soul After Death uh, from Father Seraphim Rose. Many of these quotations are from that book where he has this florilegium in the book of church fathers talking about and defending the doctrine of the toll houses. So as you can see here from the life of St. Anthony the Great written by St. Athanasius, what, what does he write about St. Anthony the Great? That he was persecuted, that he was attacked by demons when... Uh, he was seized by the Spirit and raised up by angels into the heights. The aerial demons opposed his progress and the angels disputed with them, defending St. Anthony from the aerial demons. And uh, we see more from St. John Chrysostom. And by the way, you can pause and read the fullness of the quotes. I'm just, if I just read all of the quotes, this video will be like 40 minutes. So you can... I'm not going to go to any of you who want to go more into that uh, about what the Father say. You can read Father Seraphim Rose's book on, on this issue. St. John Chrysostom uh, says, We will need many prayers, many helpers, many good deeds, a great intercession from angels on the journey through the spaces of the air. Right? Spaces of the air. Who's going to be in the space of the air? Why do we even need intercessions during this journey? Because we're going to be attacked by demons. Again, 
This is precisely what the Toll House Doctrine is talking about. And St. John likens these demons as, as publicans and tax collectors, right? So that's one of the analogies, the Toll House analogies that is used to describe what is going to happen. Again, he's not using this in a hyper-literal sense where they, they transform into tax collectors. They say, hey, sir, this is the IRS and you're supposed to pay this much debt. That's, <laughs> that's not what he's saying, right? And none of the Toll House defenders argue that way either but that rather they will act like these people and they will attack you because of the sins that you committed. It's an image that is describing something real that is about that is going to be happening to us after we die. And that something that we should really look out for, both in this life and in the afterlife. St. Macarius the Great, again, um, they hold your soul as it departs from the body and do not suffer you to rise to heaven, right? They will not want you to rise to heaven. So the demons are going to try to cock block you essentially to pardon me for using that term but they're basically going to block you uh attempt to do so saint isaiah the recluse uh sixth century father of the philokalia uh, teaches that we daily have death before we should have daily death before our eyes and take care of take care how to accomplish the departure from the body and how to pass by the powers of darkness who are to meet us in the air. The powers of darkness are going to meet us in the air. Uh, Saint Hezekius, you, you're seeing the point here, right? It's kind of the same thing over and over again. Saint Gregory the Dialogus, in his homilies on the gospel, writes, One must reflect deeply on how frightful the hour of death will be for us. What terror the soul will then experience. What remembrance of all the evils. What forgetfulness of past happiness. What fear and what apprehension of the judge. Then the evil spirits will seek out in the departing soul its deeds. Right? Do you see what's going on? If I, you know, I might be bad at explaining things, but I hope the fathers are actually, at least, you know, I hope they please you <laughs> in how they try to explain this doctrine. I mean, I think it's very evident, right? It seems like you have St. Ephraim the Syrian, um, the divine services of the Orthodox Church, which we're going to go on. Uh, later, uh, Father Seraphim Rose says, The most thorough discussion among the early church fathers of the doctrine of the aerial toll house is set forth in the homily on the departure of the soul of St. Cyril of Alexandria, which is always included in the editions of the Slavonic sequential Psalter. Among much else in this homily, St. Cyril says, What fear and trembling await you, O soul, in the day of death, you will see frightful, wild, cruel, unmerciful, and shameful demons like dark Ethiopians stand and basically saying, Demons are going to be dark, and he's using them as a... He's not saying the demons are Ethiopians, right? <laughs> um, standing before you, the very sight of them is worse than any torment. The soul seeing them becomes agitated, is disturbed and troubled, seeks to hide, hastens to the angels of God. The holy angels hold the soul, passing with them through the air and rising. The holy angels will be holding our soul, and through them we will be passing through the air, and they will defend us from demons. Detaining the soul and hindering it from ascending further. The demons are going to try to uh, basically block us again. St. Cyril says that each toll house tests the sins corresponding to it. So he uses the term toll house. Right? That's an analogy that he uses. Tests the sins corresponding to it. Each sin, each passion has its tax collectors and testers. So again, classical. The, the analogy is used there to describe the reality of what is going to happen to us after we die. And I think I can kind of just really start reading more of the church files and what they say. I think I think you get the point, right? And you can stop this video, pause this, and read more of them. But I think these fathers should be sufficient. And let's not forget, it's not just the early fathers. It's not just East, just Eastern, right? St. Boniface, the 8th century Anglo-Saxon apostle to the Germans. Even he, or even in the West, we see this kind of toll house um, doctrine. So it's both in the East and also in the West. So it is a fully Catholic belief, you can say. Not Catholic in the sense of Roman Catholic, but Catholic in the sense it's universal. It's professed by both the Eastern Patriarchs and the Western Patriarchate and before, you know, pre-schism. And there's, you know, more and more and more uh, quotations from the fathers. 
So let's get to the liturgical arguments for toll houses for now. In the Orthodox Church, in both the Greek and Slavonic Eukologion, in the canon for the departure of the soul by St. Andrew, you find in Ode 7, All holy angels of the Almighty God, have mercy upon me and save me from all the evil toll houses. For an English translation, there's a book of needs by St. Tikon. In the Greek Eukologion, in the first ode, it is said, Behold, a crowd of evil spirits has gathered bearing the record of my sins, and they are shouting aloud and demanding shamelessly my humble soul. Right? And in the Slav Slavonic Ecologion, it says, o, do, o thou that gavest birth to the Lord Almighty, when I come to die, do thou banish from me the commander of the bitter toll gatherers and ruler of the earth, that I may glorify thee unto the ages, O holy Theotokos. Right? So we are asking for defense from the Virgin Mary, from what's going to happen to us after we die. Further, these are from the pre nikonian Slavonic texts, um, which is, can, we can use them today, right? It's in the canonical Old Rite Churches. In, old five, in, in the second canto of the guardian, guardian Angel, in the Old Orthodox Prayer Book, in Ode 5, foreseeing all the tortures and torments that await me and my blindness, distance and the darkness of my passions, thou groanest with pity, thou art mournful and downcast, O my deliverer, in Ode 6, let shame and disgrace cover the dark, fallen, fetid faces of the enemy when my poor soul is separated from the body. Let thy most sacred wings then protect my soul, O my God. In Ode 7, O my helper, with thy fiery lance cease not from dispelling the myriads of invisible robbers who attack me round about, seeking to seize and steal my soul. Right? Invisible robbers. So now, they're not just tax collectors, they're not just people in tall boots, but they're also, another analogy used for them is that they are robbers. As a mind beautiful in goodness, sweet and happy, and bright like the sun, stand before me with smiling face and merry glance when I shall be taken from the earth. From the earth. Oh my God. So, I mean, that just begs the question. If it's not going to be, if demons are not going to attack us after our death, then why are we asking protection from the guardian angel? Are we asking the guardian angel to protect us from God? Well, that sort of language will not be used, right? You can say that he will advocate for us, you know, in front of God. Yes, you can say that. This is exactly what intercessory prayers were in the Old Testament as well. St. Moses advocated for Israel in many different places. And Numbers 14 is a great example. Is God basically said, you know, I'm, I'm just going to destroy Israel. Like these people, I don't want them anymore. Like these people, I have not been following you. They're not listening to me. I just want to get rid of them. I'm going to make new people. This was a mistake. And what does St. Moses say? No, God. No, 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 no. Don't do that. And he interceded and defended for them. So, I mean, you can, you can maybe say that, but that is not protection. Okay? How can, a guardian angel, how can a guardian angel protect us from God? If the guardian angel can protect us from anything, from anyone, it's going to only be demons. <laughs> and that's what the Toll House Doctrine is all about whether we are attacked by demons or not. So, and as I said, these are not my independent, I mean, these are not my independent, oh, I just happened to listen to this and I think, no, these are from, which you're going to be finding in the description below, I basically, some of these arguments I've aped from, from fathers and priests and whatever, but they use these arguments too, the Toll House Defenders. And that's what I want to emphasize is that if they feel like these are good arguments that defend their point, then you have to think, what point are they trying to make, right? Are they trying to make the point that there are literal toll boots in the air? Or are they trying to make the point that we are going to be attacked and hunted by the demons and we are going to be protected by the angels while this happening after we die? It's a very simple question. It's the second option, of course. So you can see uh, from liturgical, scriptural, and patristic evidence, the doctrine of the toll houses is definitely... An orthodox doctrine, I will even go to us to say, you should be defending this doctrine, even if you're Roman Catholic, or even if you're Oriental, right? And the fact that both of them kind of look at this and scorn and say, ah, she'll give you an indication that, you know, are these people really the defenders of tradition? Uh, or are they just saying that to look cool? So, in conclusion, 
The Toll House's doctrine does not mean that our salvation is dependent on the judgment of demons. It rather means that the demons are accusers like they always are and will do everything they can to drag our souls to hell with them. You can think of this as a courtroom. The guardian angels are our defense attorneys. And the demons are the prosecutors. And the demons will try their absolute best to make us fall. One of the ways they can make us fall is to make us think and deceive us into thinking that God cannot have mercy on us and forgive our sins. If we end up having that mindset, what we're basically doing is that we're jumping from a very we're jumping from a mountain into a pool where it says hell. If you jump into this pool, welcome to hell. And we're basically doing a quadruple backflip. And we're doing that and we're quadruple backflipping ourselves into hell by doing so and falling into despondency and despair. Um, this is one of the many tricks that demons use against us in this life and in the afterlife. There are no more fake literal toll booths in the air inhabited by demons, right? The toll house descriptor is allegorical, but it refers to something real. So what it refers to is 100% real. And this is what the Toll House defenders are trying to argue. And that is that our souls will be attacked and will be in combat against demons. And we will be protected by God, His saints, and His angels in our journey from, um, from this life to the next life. This doctrine is un contested it is absolutely in scripture it is absolutely in the church fathers and it is absolutely in the liturgy the implication is very simple if you're an orthodox christian toll houses are not only true you can't just say oh they're true they're also dogmatic 100 percent. i know that there's been ecclesial debates on this i don't care we see this in scripture church fathers, and liturgy how can something that is in scripture church fathers, and liturgy be merely a theologumenon if that can be theologumenon, everything can be theologumenon. Let's not let's not kid ourselves, okay? This is not a theologumenon. This is not something that you can. Oh, I'll just if you don't believe in the toll houses, what the Saint I believe either Saint Ignatius Branchino says this or Saint Theophan the Recluse says this. One of the two. What do they say? Well, or wise men might say the toll houses are not real, but they're gonna pass through them nevertheless. So it doesn't really matter if you think it's it's. In, it doesn't matter in the sense you're going to pass through it anyway. But it does matter that if you believe in it, first of all, you're going to be prepared for it. And second of all, you're not going to be going against an orthodox dogma. As I said, this is dogmatic. Even if you have bishops and priests kind of um, trying to go around, even those who defend the doctrine of the toll houses. No, this is absolutely dogmatic. St. Vincent of Lyrin, St. Augustine, and John of Sebastia in the C Council of Chalcedon, they all unanimously say the church has authority and we know what is dogmatic and what is not from numbers, antiquity, and universality. The antiquity refers to whether it's patristic, whether, you, whether we can find this in scripture, church fathers, and whatnot. We can do that. Is it accepted by a consensus? Well, the consensus of the fathers seem pretty evident, even from this video, but you can look into it more and more. So there's consensus, there's numbers. Is it universal? What does it mean? Is it just merely a regional doctrine that's, you know, something that was only professed in the East? Or is it both in the East, further East, and also in the West? Well, we have seen both Eastern and Western fathers uh, profess this doctrine. This can be in different languages, but it is the same doctrine. It is the same reality that they're talking about. So all of these qualifications are now fulfilled. There's nothing stopping us from saying this is a dogmatic belief. And this, this goes to, you know, one has to wonder, why is there no debate about this in the East, but only in America, right? Not in England, just, just in America. Why is there a debate in America? Because of many reasons. Um... One of those reasons, uh, some of those are depressive reasons, but I will give you a simple reason. One of the reasons is because the East never even thought this was a topic of debate. It just seems, you know, seems very logical. And I think if you're still, if you still have problems with the Toll House Doctrine, you have to ask yourself, when we die, what happens to our soul? Do we teleport to heaven? Do we just teleport ourselves to heaven? Do we just be grabbed by angels and never get tempted? It's just a capsule that we just sit in. Well, what else do you think is going to happen? Do you think the demons are these nice guys who are just going to say, oh, oh, he died, so let's just leave him alone now. No, absolutely not. 
The demons are evil, evil beings. They're going to try their absolute best to drag us to hell. And even if we die, that's not going to stop them. So that is all I wanted to say for this video. And, I, and again, um, I hope my video has been helpful for you. If you want the more detailed analysis of the Toll House Doctrine, you can uh, check out the articles I will be putting in the description below. You can look at what Father Seraphim Rose says. You can look at what the Monastery of St. Anthony, uh, Anthony Monastery says. They released a thousand page book on the issue that I think is a final word on the issue. You can look at Father John Whiteford. He talks about this uh, quite extensively, both in Craig's channel and also in his blog. And, you know, many other priests and even bishops have been talking about this and defending the doctrine of toll houses. So you can find a lot of literature. I kind of just want to stay kind of the, the simple level. Right? And thank you for watching this. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. God be with you all. Thank you.